All right, so tonight we'll be talking about Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. Um, and we talked before about hortatory nuclei. And so, um, again, the word hortatory means it's, it has to do with like an exhortation when you exhort someone. Uh, that's the, the, they come from the same word, so it's you exhort uh, and, and hortatory. So it's just a teaching. And a nu nuclei is just plural for nucleus. And so like a nucleus is just like it's a section that's teaching. To, to exhort on something. So um, this is tonight, uh, what, what we're going to be looking at is going to be the third and fourth hortatory nuclei, nucleuses, nuclei, yeah, nuclei. Um, the first one is going to be in verses one to five, and the focus of that teaching is going to be imitate God, and then the next teaching is going to be on verses six to 14, which is going to be to walk in the light. Um, some people would argue that that is one teaching, to imitate God and to walk in the light. And if you believe that it's one teaching, then just take however many hortatory nuclei there are and subtract one, because these two are one. Um, I think that based on uh, their, the, the grammar in the text, I think that they're two different teachings, but they're not you know, super different because if you're imitating God, then you should be walking in the light. But if you haven't looked at it yet, you'll probably understand kind of what I mean uh, when we start talking about this. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that some people disagree about how to break it down. Uh, and it's not like a crucial thing how you break it down, um, just so long as you understand what's being taught on both parts. Um, one other thing that I want to talk about is as we look at this uh, and uh, try to understand this, we're going to see tonight some present tense imp imperatives. And so an imperative uh, is when you tell somebody to do something. So go brush your teeth. Uh, that that um, verb go and brush, though both of those verbs are imperative. Go is telling them to like move in a direction. Brush is telling them to brush. Uh, so instead of I brushed my teeth, that wouldn't be imperative because that's just a statement. That would just be indicative. But an imperative is telling someone to do something. So Paul, of course, when he's giving this, these hortatory teachings, um, these exhortations, he's going to be using imperatives. And almost all the time, he uses uh, a past imperative, what we call an aorist imperative. And the, the way you would translate an aorist imperative is with a completed action. So you would say, write this, do that, uh, walk there. There are actions that you do it, and then they're done. All right, so if you say, draw a line on a piece of paper, you draw the line, the line has been drawn. There's no continuation of that process, it's just done. However, a present imperative, brings on a different nuance into the word. And the nuance is that it's not something that is a one and done, it's a continual process. So tonight, we're going to see in, in, uh, a present imperative, and that present imperative is be. And in verse one, it's going to say, be imitators of God. And that be is a present imperative. And what that means is, it is not a one and done thing. You don't just flip a switch and you are all of a sudden an imitator of God. The word, by grammatical definition, I guess, would, uh, would imply that it is an ongoing process. And I think that makes sense to us. You know, it's not like we got baptized and when we came out of the water, bang, boom, zowie, zap, we were this light for God and we never did anything wrong after that and we were exactly like Jesus Christ. That wasn't my experience. I don't know anybody who, who had that experience. Uh, and so it's, it's a continual process, but it's actually even written into the text that it's, it, Paul knows it's a continual process and he knows it's something that uh, will continue to be worked on. It's not a one and done, it's continual. Does that make sense to everybody? I have a question. Yes. Um, and this may not be something you can answer right off the top of your head, um, but in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, I have pointed out that the last part of the verse is like continually in Greek the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin, that that's like he continually cleanses us from all sin. Um, so I don't know. What's the verse, First John 4, 7? First John 1, 7. 1, 7. 1, 7. All right, read, read what your, your Bible says for First John 1, 7. Um, but... If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son, Jesus, cleanses us from yeah. all sin. Yep, so, so that's continually. That's, that's uh, yeah, it's, it's a present indicative 
And so if, if they wanted to say a once and done action, then they, they would, the rider would have to use an aorist indicative. However, he, um, and that, that would be translated, he cleansed us, but um, the, the word is a present in, indicative. And so it's, he is cleansing us. Greek is really cool. It's, it's like a lot of languages today, not like English, but like uh, if you've ever learned another language, they have endings and their ending shows a lot about the word. You know, they, they have endings that, that talk about the past and future. And we usually just kind of change our words or add something um, to it, but uh, they, they have endings that indicate it. So yeah, that is, that's a correct statement um, from the Greek. All right. That reminded me of that. Yep. Whoever told you that, I agree with them. All right. All right. So let's begin with uh, a read through of the text. And because this text, I believe, is two different uh, exhortations, let's read them one at a time. So could I ask somebody to read verses one to five? And then later after we get through one to five, somebody else can read six to 14. Or maybe I, I can do that. But could, could I have someone read verses one to five now? Do it. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. All right, so the, the teaching is uh, pretty clear, and it is right there, in, in my opinion, uh, well, not, not in, in, in my opinion, just right there, it's be imitators of God. It's like right at the outset, um, verse one, be imitators, uh, that, therefore be imitators of God. Uh, this is, it's, it's not an idea that's foreign to us, um, but it's definitely an idea that was what would have been common in that Jewish culture. Children were told to imitate their parents, uh, and it was very important in an honor-shame culture. So we don't live in an honor-shame culture in the United States, um, but most of the world still actually lives in an honor-shame culture. And I, I say most of the world, I guess numerically most of the world, because India, China, Japan, they still live in an honor-shame culture. So if you do something shameful, that doesn't just reflect on you, it reflects on your family name. And so the, the charge is imitate your parents, okay? If your parents are shameful people, if you do shameful things, you're just bringing on to the family name exactly what they're bringing on to the family name. But on the flip side, if your parents are honorable, you're bringing honor to the family name. So do what your parents do, imitate them and bring the same honor to your family name that you're supposed to. Uh, I think it's really interesting that to, to not live in an honor shame culture, but look at an honor shame culture because it's it's kind of foreign to us. But it, it, to me, it kind of makes sense because when he's when God's saying, "Be imitators of me," he's saying, "Look, you're representing my name," and and we are. We call ourselves Christians. I I, I call myself a Christian anyway. I, I'm wearing Christ's name. So the things that I do, if if I say I'm a Christian, but I'm being hateful and and doing shameful things, that's bringing shame onto the name of Christ. People see that. People catch that, and, and that, that changes their minds, that changes their opinions. Um, some people have very low opinions of Christians. Uh, some people on the flip side have very high opinions of Christians, and it's just because the things that we do, that shows the world. And so that's why uh, in, in their culture, kids were always told, be imitators of your parents. We are told to be an imitator of, of our God, of, of Christ specifically. Uh, well, it says God, God specifically, but in verse 2, it'll talk about Christ, but, um, but we're, we're told to be imitators of God. Let's, Im let's imitate our, our dad, so, so to speak, um, and therefore bring honor to the name as he has brought honor to the name. Um, all right, so therefore be imitators of God, and not just imitators only, but as beloved children. See, there, that, that family aspect. And walk in love as Christ love us, loved us and gave up himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, Christ has already done this. He walked in love uh, and he gave himself up as a sin offering for us. He already did that. He already gave us the example. If he didn't, then when he said, be imitators of me, 
how can we do that? How can we be an imitator of God if we haven't seen it? But we have, we, we have the scriptures. He, he did it. He showed us. Uh, and, and again, Paul's writing to some people that would have possibly seen Jesus or, or you know, been friends or, or relatives of someone who had seen like the, the physical Jesus on, on earth. And so um, he put that example out there for him. We're supposed to be following that example. Uh, we're supposed to be walking as those who are clothed in love. All right. And then moving on to verse uh, three. My version, the English Standard Version, says but at the start of this. And I don't love the, that translation. As weird as it is, um, you know, to, to, to take up issue with, with something that says but. Um, but I, usually when I think of but, I think of it, it's like, you know, not this, but that. Um, and here he's not going to be saying not this, but that. He's going to say, like, how we ought to be imitators of God. He's going to give specifics on how we ought to be imitators of God. So I don't think, but to me makes, makes logical sense. But anyway, um, I, the, the word is, is a very um, fluid word. It can mean but or and or so or now um, and a few other things. It's a very fluid word. Uh, the word is day, if anyone cares. Um, it's, a, it's the most common conjunction. So I, I like now or because of this, maybe instead, but because of this, uh, sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among the saints. Um, I've taught this to teens, and uh, I think it's interesting when, when we talk about sexual immorality, a lot of uh, older people have been studying the Bible a while. We have an idea of what sexual immorality is. Uh, it was interesting to teach it to teens because someone asked me, what does sexual immorality mean? It's like, huh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, the, the, the base answer of that would be any sexual act that is deviant from that which God has specifically called holy. And uh, so that's, that's a very confusing way of saying if it's between a man and his wife and only that, then it's okay. And, and anything that is not there is sexually deviant. Uh, and the one litmus test that I like to do is if you have to explain why it's okay, it's probably not okay. <laughs> um, I don't, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this to you guys as, as though you, you need it. I just, that's, the, I, I, I like saying that when I, when I say to teach teens about sexual immorality, I think that's, that just seems to me the, the good way to do it because sometimes they'll be like, well, you know, what if we could do this? Or, you know, I think it would probably be fine. If, no, I mean, if you have to explain it away, it's not okay. If you wouldn't do it in front of your youth minister and your parents, you probably shouldn't be doing it until you're married. So uh, anyway, uh, so, but all sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Uh, I think this is probably a, a clear teaching, but when it says it must not even be named among you, they shouldn't be able to point it out and say, look there, or, or it, it, they, they shouldn't even be able to accuse you of it. We, we should be people so above reproach, we can't even be accused of wrongdoing. Now, that isn't a completely uh, fail-safe way because people can accuse anybody of anything. Um, so I, it, it doesn't mean it's impossible to accuse, but you should be the type of person that when someone accuses, everyone's like, no, that, that can't really be the case because we're above reproach. So shouldn't even be named among us. All right. Uh, verse four, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Uh, this verse, I think, gets used a whole lot by a whole lot of people who don't understand that we don't understand. Let me explain what I mean. Um, I have heard this verse used to, to say why we shouldn't make you know, certain kind of jokes or why, why we sh shouldn't use certain kind of words, uh, specifically because it says, let there not be no filthiness or foolish talk. Um, you know, what, what can we, f filthiness seems to, to make sense what it's, what it's saying, anything that's filthy, anything that's not clean. Um, uh, and foolish talk, there might, might be a little bit more wiggle room, but anything that is not wise to say, anything that's, that's foolish or irreverent or babble, um, but then no crude joking. I've heard a lot of people give a whole lot of strong opinions about what it means, crude joking. Is this joking at somebody else's expense? Uh, is this jokes of, you know, sexual matter? Is this, is this jokes with unclean words? Um, what kind of jokes are these? And my answer to you is that this word is a hapax logomenon. 
which again is a fancy way of saying it's a word only used once in the New Testament. And when a word is only used once in the New Testament, what that usually means is we don't have a clear definition of exactly what it's talking about. Now we can translate it to say crude joking with pretty decent certainty because the word, it's like other words enough that, that we, can, we can extrapolate the definition. The only thing that we can't for sure extrapolate is what exactly Paul's talking about. When he says crude joking, what did he have in mind? Uh, since this word is only used once, we can't say, well, when, when this writer used it here, they were talking about this, so maybe he's talking about this. That doesn't work. It's only used once, and Paul didn't hand us a lexicon. He didn't hand us a dictionary of the words that he was using in his letters. So I, I just want to address the fact that I've heard this verse used about different things, and people say different things about crude joking. I, and all I can say is... Um, I don't know exactly what, what Paul was talking about, um, but I will say that the teaching is let there be thanksgiving. So if you want to know whether or not it's something that, that should be said, could it be characterized as something that is thanksgiving? Well, if it's not something that, should, that, that could be characterized as thanksgiving, you got to weigh your words carefully. Now, not everything can be thanksgiving, right? Sometimes we got to get in the nitty gritty. Sometimes we got to talk, uh, you know, to, 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 to people about serious things and kind of impossible to make every conversation, uh, even, even hard conversations about Thanksgiving. Like, for example, Jesus tells us that if a brother is in the wrong, we ought to take a witness and go and talk to them. That conversation might be hard to go through Thanksgiving. So, so it's, it's not a perfect litmus test, but we got to weigh our words carefully if we can't say this is very obviously with Thanksgiving. I hope I made that clear. I walked in a few circles there. I, I can tell I'm getting tired, so I, I hope we're all good on that one. Uh, and I'll read one, one more verse, then we can open up for any questions or comments. Uh, verse five, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, he has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And so here saying an inheritance, I believe he's, he's drawing back to the first verse in the, uh, the family uh, idea sim symbol that he's using here because he says be imitators of God like was very common to tell children be imitators of your parents uh, in the Jewish culture so he's saying be imitators of God uh, as beloved children and so when you're imitating God don't be sexually impure or covetous uh, say don't talk so filthy or with crude joking but be with thanksgiving because if you're going to be like these things, then you have no inheritance. That inheritance is, to me, a familiar word, word because it's what you get from your family when they die. Um, so you have no inheritance if you're going to be doing these things. So be imitators of God, because God wouldn't do these things. So the teaching really is be, be an imitator, and these are things uh, that would be in our way of imitating God. All right, so that's the first teaching nucleus. Are there any comments about verses 1 to 5? or questions. All right. Um, for anybody who's paying attention, uh, I guess, to, to, to last week or, or maybe watch the video, I don't want to spend too much time explaining it again, but I just want to bring it up as far as continuity goes. Last week we talked about antithetical parallelism, which I said last week, I, I think it's, the, that, that phrase is convoluted. It sounds harder than it should be. It's just two things that are put next to each other that are parallel, but they're, they're not parallel because they're like each other. They're parallel in such a way that they're the exact opposite. And that's what verse four was. And the reason for antithetical parallelism is it's a symbolism that just draws attention to that verse. Uh, and so in verse four, when it says, let there be no foolishness or filthy, filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, but instead thanksgiving, those are opposites. And so they're, they're parallel in that they are exact opposites of each other. Thanksgiving is the opposite of these things. Um, so that's done to bring out symbolism. And then in the second week of classes, I talked about a chiasm. And a chiasm is uh, this, I, I think I pulled out, I didn't, did share screen the, the first time I talked about it. It's done in su such a way that it makes like a triangle because you talk about topic one and then topic two, and then you, however many, and then you get to the peak and then you'll go back. So if it's one, two, and then you talk about the peak and then you talk about two and then you talk about one. 
that's done in these verses. And the reason that's important is because whenever a chiasm is brought out in the text, it's to highlight a certain verse. And the verse that it highlights is verse four. So it's interesting, Paul uses a chiasm and the antithetical parallelism to make sure that the emphasis was on verse four. Uh, so I would tend to think uh, that the reason this is, is Paul has probably heard some negative reports about the words that are coming out of their mouth. They're either grumbling, they're, they're filthy talking, they're, the way they're talking is not an imitation of God. And so I think Paul wants to bring a little bit of uh, grammatical symbolism and, um, not, not grammatical symbolism, some uh, sig significance uh, through, through the way he writes to the fact that their speech needs to be cleaned up a little bit. So uh, I, I think that's, that's a good thing to know. Our speech needs to be cleaned up a little bit. Maybe we're not in Ephesus right now, but we can still use that teaching. All right, let's move on into uh, the next verses. Could I get someone to read verses 6 to 14? I can do it. Thanks, baby. Okay. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful to even to speak of the things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed to the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. All right, thank you. Um, here we see very, uh, very, very often he's using uh, what, what's called contrasting semantic domain. And that just means he's going to be going back and forth between dark and light. He's going to use words that are talking about darkness. He's going to be using words that are talking about light. He never specifically says uh, what dark is and what light is, it's expected that we know what, what the, the metaphor is referring to. Um, but to this day, I've never had anybody who has really had to question what dark is referring to and what light is referring to. So I think we're, we're all on the same page. Um, light, of course, talking about that which, which is, is uh, touched by God, it is, is holy, it's, it's there in the light, and then darkness is that which is separated from God. Um, so uh, verse 6 it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Uh, these empty words, of course, would, would be talking about people who are uh, saying things that aren't true. They're empty. Uh, they're, they're giving false teachings. Uh, they're, they're saying things that just there's nothing to it. Uh, the words of scripture would not be empty words because those words have power behind them. Those words have truth behind them. Those words have important and, importance and significance behind them. Those are anything but empty. These empty words that he's talking about are words that are meant to, to, to seem like they, they have significance, but really are not. So he's saying, don't fall for those. Um, don't be deceived by them. Those things are causing the sons of disobedience wrath. And that, that is very simply saying, for these reasons, these sons of dis disobedience, which is just saying the, these people who are being disobedient are going to feel wrath. Usually wrath is talking about hell. They're going to be punished uh, for this. All right. Verse 7 says, therefore, do not become partners with them. So since these people are going to have wrath come on them, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness. And I think that's interesting. Not you were in darkness, but at one time you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Fruit of light is in all that is good and right and true. So he's saying, you guys not were in darkness, but you were darkness. That, that which your being was made up of was darkness because you were apart from God. Uh, so I think it's interesting, even the, the Jews who, who maybe were really holy Jews, maybe they, they made it every year for the sacrifice and did everything that, that they were supposed to. Reading this, how would that sound? You know, you were darkness, but he's doing this, I believe, not to not to point out specifically how bad they were, but to point out how great Christ is. 
So certainly some of these guys who, who would be, be reading this in the church of Ephesus could have been like the worst of the worst, you know, could have been like temple cult prostitutes for all we know. Um, they, cause they, they had called prostitutes, uh, in, in the, the temples in Ephesus. So some of these could, could have been that. And, and as far as societal standards, those are like the lowest of the lows. Some of them could have been devout Jews. The point isn't where you came from. The point is the light that you are now in. You were once not illuminated by Christ. Now you are. Now you are in this light because you are in Christ. All right. Verse 10 and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. I love that. Um, the reason I love that is it seems like when, when I, when I personally read and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, it leaves me a little bit of wiggle room. And, and some of you guys may be uncomfortable with that idea. Uh, and that's, that's okay. W what I mean by wiggle room is I may not do absolutely everything the right way. The purpose that I need to fulfill is that I need to try my best to try my best to, to be studying the scriptures, testing, be testing everything that I do, every tradition that I, that I have every, you know, what I do on Sunday mornings, uh, what, what I do on Wednesday nights, how I read my Bible, how I live my life. I need to be testing. Is this what God called me to do? Is this what God called me to do continually trying to think about that and trying to make sure I'm coming to the right conclusion. But when I read this, I hear, a little bit of wiggle room. I'm, and, and I'm not saying wiggle room so much so as everybody who thinks that what they're doing is right is going to be saved no matter what they're doing. All I'm saying is Paul doesn't say discern what is pleasing to the Lord and don't mess up. He says try. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So what I hear is we need to be people who are always trying to do our best and always testing and always reading our Bibles and doing everything we can to make sure we are pleasing to the Lord. And that's what's important. We don't focus on the wiggle room. We, we don't say, well, this verse says try, so if I fail, it doesn't matter. We focus on, on doing and doing our best. But when we learn better, we do better. When we understand more, we do more. I hope I made that clear. Are there any comments about that specifically? I think that's um, a good thing to point out. Like I, I kind of look at it in the same way, but I guess it gives me a different like charge. I don't know if I'm just thinking about it differently or whatever. Um, it kind of like explains to me, um, I feel like a lot of the things in the Bible, I don't know if anybody else feels like that, but like when I read it, like when it's like a command or something, I'm just like, oh, that's why I feel like the need to do this. And like, I don't know if it's just like from like being raised in the church or if it's just something that like God innately puts in our hearts. Um, but like, I'm constantly like trying to like find collections of verses that like tell me like different godly attributes to try and have and different um, ways to define love and like how to live out a like truly like christ-like life and like there's all kinds of verses like that in the bible but i'm all, always trying to you know trying to discern what is pleasing to the lord and like i don't know it's just one of those things that like i guess you kind of gloss over um until you point it out you know someone points it out to you and we're just like oh that's why i i'm always feeling like that you know mm -hmm. and and that that's a good feeling uh I'm, I'm certain all of us probably either know someone or know of someone who uh, we would probably characterize as someone who is not trying to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, who, who, has, who has stopped. Um, I know people who, who have gone uh, and, and been in denominational worlds who I believe do try and discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And of course, I, I disagree with the conclusion that, that they come to, but I, I do believe that, that they're, they are trying. I also know people in the denominational world who I believe have not tried or either it, it, if they did at one point they have stopped trying uh, or, or maybe that 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 they try first to decide what they want and then see how, how they can explain it away um, but I, I don't want to say all this to to bash anybody else I just want to say I want to make sure I'm not that person I think that's that's what this te teaching is saying make sure you're always um, pushing to make sure that that you you're doing what, what you can uh, I love what what Paul says to Timothy, I believe it's in Timothy, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Is that not in Timothy? That's in Philippians. That's in Philippians. It's in Philippians. Work out your own salvation with, with fear and trembling. We're working it out, right? We're, 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 we're along our, our way. Um, we, we might not be doing everything perfect right now, but we're going to keep trying as hard as we can. Uh, and, and our hope would be that if we do get to heaven and we find out we were doing something wrong, that God will have seen that our hearts show that we really were trying our best to, to, to do what is right. Um, I think the, the best way I can do this is to every now and then look at the things that I'm doing and say, all right, if I'm wrong, I'm going to find out why and study the scriptures like that. Study the scriptures as if I'm wrong and then turn around, study the scriptures as, as if I'm right. And if I come out doing the same thing, great. I'll keep doing that and I'll keep trying to discern what is pleasing to God. All right, any other comments about that idea? I spent a lot of time on it just because I, I like it. I don't know. I think, um, I think one strength of, of Millview uh, and, and churches in our brotherhood is, is, our, uh, is our, our ability to, to, to follow this verse right here, is that our ability to continually be looking at the scriptures and continually be putting our noses in, in the, the bind of our Bible, making sure that we understand what's written in here. We understand individually what's in this blueprint so that we're doing it right. I think that's one of our strengths and I think that's great. It's Philippians 2.12, in case... It was Philippians. Who said it was Timothy? Not me. Good thing we're not recording this, because <laughs> then you guys could prove me that I did say Timothy, but I said Philippians eventually. All right. Um, verse 11. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. All right, don't, don't be doing them, but be pointing those out. Uh, I like, instead of the, the word expose, I, I prefer the translation rebuke. I think it's a little bit more accurate. Um, but in, in, in any case, um, it, it works. Just bring those out. I, I like, the, the reason I like rebuke is not, not only because I think that, that the word is better, but it, it to me gives the, the idea of the, these aren't just like works in darkness and works exposing the works. We're rebuking the people who are doing them. And we don't do so. Uh, I, but Buddy talked about speaking the truth in love tonight. Uh, it was a lesson geared towards teens, but I learned from it, uh, and I, I would suggest going and watching it. It's it's on YouTube. It'll be re recorded under the uh, SYS Nashville, so I would suggest going and looking it up. Um, but but he was uh, he was talking about you know if people are doing wrong, you got to speak the truth to them in love, and that comes from love. Uh, so our love for them says, look, I want you to be doing what's right. So I want you to know the truth, and so I'm going to t teach you this truth in love. But part of that is rebuking sometimes. Um, so anyway, so take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead rebuke them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. I think that's interesting. It's shameful even to talk about the things that they're doing. The things that they're doing are so bad, it's shameful even to talk about it. But when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We are mirrors. Uh, we are not candles. I love this, uh, this song, This Little Light of Mine, I Will Let It Shine. I just think symbolically it's a little bit inaccurate because I don't think we have our own individual lights that we're letting shine. I think our goal is to be a mirror, and Christ is the light. We don't have light ourselves. We stand in the light, and that light reflects. In any mirror who is not standing in the light, they're not reflecting Christ. Our job is to stand in the light, to live like Christ, to live that life, and to reflect him. So when it says, and Christ will shine on you, him shining on you, and then you shine that light to the world. Um, so I hope, I hope that doesn't ruin this little light of mine for anybody. I still like the song. I'm not trying to, to talk, talk bad about the song. I just, I think it's a little bit symbolically inaccurate, but. I'm, a, I'm, I'm too nitpicky. <laughs> um, but all right, so, so the, the, the whole teaching of verses 6 to 14 is walk in the light, not as those in darkness, uh, as you were once darkness, but walk as those in the light, so much so in the light that you're going to be exposing uh, or rebuking those who are in darkness or the deeds that are in darkness so that when you bring them to light, they'll be known uh, and they'll, they'll come into light rather than remain in darkness. So the two teachings... Uh, verses 1 to 5, uh, imitate God, and verses um, 6 to 14, walk in the light. Um, 
Are there any comments about verses 6 to 14? I have a big comment or question. Okay, so I noticed how you said it says, and also while I was reading, it's talking about like, you were darkness, but you are light. And like, I've already said this several times, but I'm like a first John kind of person. That's just like my book. Mm -hmm. um, and it always, it's talking about like, walk in darkness and walk in the light. So like, is there a reason that there's like a different terminology? Is there like, a, is that like a big difference? Is he like trying to make a different point right here? Or is it just like basically the same thing? When, when he's saying you were darkness rather than walking in the darkness? Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's, it's be, because he's saying that we ourselves are not light. Christ is the light and we only walk in him. So we ourselves are darkness and without Christ, we are darkness. We only become light when we imitate God and when we, we walk in what Christ is doing. That's why I think it's important to see that he's closing this, this little hortatory nuclei in verse uh, 14 when he says, and Christ will shine on you because we were darkness. And one could argue we are darkness, but when we're in that light, that's how we become light. Because in verse um, 13 says, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. So we were darkness, but then we're exposed by the light that is Christ, and we become light by being in the light. So that's, that's why I think it says you were darkness rather than you were in darkness. Okay, it's just trying to, like, make the point more clear, like, trying to be more punctuated, I guess. Yeah. It could also be that Paul just didn't want to put the word in there. <laughs> I accept that sometimes I, I read into what Paul was saying, and it's very possible that he was not meaning what I say. That's um, part of exegesis. <laughs> yeah, I think that happens, like when i mean obviously the bible is way more important than any other book but i think it's interesting that sometimes like i feel like obviously in english class when you're in high school or whatever um you know they'll they'll like read so much into like the green light or whatever you know what i'm talking about and it's just like really did they really mean that but like with the bible they really could you know yeah yeah <laughs> Well, I, I'll, to, to, to tie things back in, I think that this is just all about trying to discern what is pleasing to Christ. If we're trying to discern what's pleasing to Christ, let's spend some extra time on verses, nitty gritty, going and trying to say, let's completely do our best to try to pull out the meaning of this text. And if we go a little bit far and, and assume things, uh, like, like assume that, that Paul, Paul meant some sort of symbolism when really he was just putting things, we're, we're trying. And as long as it doesn't lead us to an improper teaching, then I don't think we're going to be blamed for t taking it one step further than Paul meant to take it. I think we'll be awarded for it, but. That's good. Any other comments about verses, um, or anything that we talked about tonight, verses 1 to 14? I feel bad for keeping talking, but I have another thing. Right. <laughs> um. I don't know if anybody else, when um, Trenton was talking about like shame and honor and stuff, was thinking about um, in Romans 12. Um, I really like this chapter. Um, but in starting in verse 9, it says, Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. And I feel like those two verses kind of encapsulate what this part of the chapter and Ephesians is talking about I don't know if that's what you were trying to put across but I was just like wow that I feel like those two verses really go along with what's being said here yeah just reminded me I think you're right um sorry I'm thinking um, I was I was pulling up my notes for next week so that I could remember what, what we're talking about next week. And so I, I'm, I've told you guys before that the notes that I have for this class are notes that I've used before. When I pulled up my notes for next week, the first thing it says in the notes is I accidentally didn't go over verses 15 to 21 last week, which means <laughs> that means we're supposed to go over verses 15 to 21 right now. 
um, <laughs> as part of this week. And I didn't allot time for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I try to stick to 45 minutes of teaching and we're right there. Um, I hate homework. I remember, I remember why. So I, I co-taught this with, with the, the preacher there in, in, um, in Georgia. And the reason why is because he was going off of one understanding of the structure and I was going off of another understanding of the structure. So I believe that verses 15 to 21 are structurally a part of verses um, 21 or 22 to 35. And I believe they tie in a whole lot with what we're talking about tonight. But I think, based on the structure and how things are written now, that they directly tie into the wives and husbands and um, slaves and masters teaching. Uh, so personally, I think the structure works better there. And I think that's what I'll stick with. I think I'll stick with starting with verse 15 next week. Um, and I, I hope you guys will forgive me. But if you want your homework, you can read verses 15 to 21 and know that in commentaries, there's a pretty split disagreement about whether verses 15 to 21 is tied in with verses 1 to 14 or verses 22 to the end of the chapter. So, sorry, I'm, I'm really, I'm floundering right now because I just, I, it's so jarring to, to, to open up my notes for next week so I can tell you guys what we're going to be talking about next week and seeing that I said in my notes that I meant to talk about it the week before. Um, I, I, I remember why I didn't, but it was, it was because of a difference in notes between me and the preacher there. But I'm, I'm going to stick with verses 15 and following next week and we'll talk about the structure there and I'll ask for your forgiveness if I need to. All right, any other comments before we move on to prayer time? You want to stop the recording? Yes, <laughs> I do. Make, Make it a great week. week.